Welcome. If you've been following news about COVID-19, and it's pretty hard not to, you're probably aware of the controversy around use of the antiparasitic drug ivermectin as a treatment for COVID-19. The evidence for the use of ivermectin for COVID-19 has never been very strong. But at this point, I think it's fair to say that ivermectin has a problem. And in this video, I'm going to go through some of the issues that have recently come to light. I want to cover some recent developments regarding the use of ivermectin for COVID-19. Spoiler alert, it doesn't look good. In fact, while the weakness of the case for ivermectin in COVID-19 has been apparent for some time, at this point, the wheels have really come off the ivermectin wagon. As usual, everything I'll discuss in this video is going to be based on the scientific literature, and I will have links to all the literature I discuss in the description below. So let's get started. So first, how did this begin? What launched the interest in ivermectin for COVID-19? Well, starting early in the pandemic, there were a bunch of efforts around the world to what was called repurpose existing drugs, and that was to help treat COVID-19. Some of these efforts have been successful. Remdesivir, fluvoxamine, various corticosteroids, and other inexpensive medications are all being used to help treat COVID patients. Ivermectin was certainly one of the drugs tried. It's been tested in screens alongside other drugs, and it's been tested on its own. The first publication that really drew a lot of attention to ivermectin for COVID-19 was this 2020 study by Cali et al. In this study, they tested ivermectin's ability to inhibit the replication of SARS-CoV-2, that's the causative virus of COVID-19, in vitro. That is to say, in a dish or in cell culture. The cells they used for this experiment were Vero E6 cells. That's a kidney cell line originally derived from an African green monkey in 1962. Vero cells are often used to culture viruses or to produce vaccines. In fact, the Sinovac or Coronavac vaccine that was developed in China for COVID-19 is produced using Vero cell culture. Cali et al. were able to show that ivermectin inhibited the replication of SARS-CoV-2 in Vero cells, and this was shown at a concentration of about 2 micromolar. That paper came out in the middle of 2020, but just recently another paper came out that followed up directly on the work of Cali et al. This other paper used two agents in the same class as ivermectin, ivermectin and moxidectin and they used multiple cell lines, as well as some detailed time-dependent studies in Vero cells. The authors of this recent paper were able to reproduce the results of Cali et al. They showed that ivermectin and moxidectin inhibited SARS-CoV-2 replication in Vero E6 cells. But they also showed that in cells derived from human airway cells, which are a better model for SARS-CoV-2 in humans, Neither of those agents was able to inhibit SARS-CoV-2 replication. Even when they raised the concentrations up to 10 micromolar, which is quite a bit higher than they needed to inhibit in Vero E6 cells. Quoting from the paper, these disappointing results call for a word of caution in the interpretation of anti-SARS-CoV-2 activity, of drugs solely based on their activity in Vero cells. Altogether, these findings suggest that even using a high-dose regimen of ivermectin or switching to another drug in the same class is unlikely to be useful for treatment of SARS-CoV-2 in humans. Now, if you're wondering about the details of this, yes, they did really reproduce the results of Cali et al. This is part of Figure 1, where they show quite clearly that they're able to inhibit the formation of viral plaques, a measure of viral replication, at a concentration of something like 2 micromolar for ivermectin itself and 4.5 micromolar for moxidectin. But when they moved to lung cells, 
This is CalU3 cells or primary bronchial epithelial cells. They weren't able to inhibit viral replication, even at 10 micromolar. This is an important follow-up to the original story that provided the initial impulse to study ivermectin for COVID-19. One shouldn't jump to clinical conclusions from a single result in a relatively irrelevant cell line model. What about the meta-analysis? If you follow this story at all, you're probably aware that there have been some very prominent, widely touted meta-analyses that have been described as in support of ivermectin for COVID-19. Probably the one that has been most discussed is this one by Bryant Lowry et al. Dr. Tess Lowry is a well-known proponent of ivermectin, and she's a founder of the BIRD, B-I-R-D group in the United Kingdom for the use of ivermectin to treat COVID-19. They published this meta-analysis in the American Journal of Therapeutics in 2021, and many ivermectin advocates describe it as compelling. But it's not really. Scientists with expertise in meta-analysis have long recognized its flaws, and just last week, the editor-in-chief of the American Journal of Therapeutics issued what's called an expression of concern for this article. I'm not going to reproduce the full expression of concern in this slide deck because it's marked not for reproduction, but I'll provide the link to that expression of concern in the description of this video so you can go and view it for yourself. But you might be wondering, what is an expression of concern? What does that mean? Is it even really a thing? Well, yes, it is. An expression of concern, it's something that's issued on occasion in scholarly publishing. The specifics vary, and it depends on the academic discipline and the journal, but basically it's a notice that gets issued by a publisher or an editor. It's a notice against a particular article, against a particular publication in a journal. It's a notice to warn readers that that article or that publication might be erroneous. It might be wrong, or it might be untrustworthy, or there may even be some misconduct. An expression of concern might be issued for a number of reasons. It may happen when the publisher finds that an article is wrong, but perhaps for posterity, they don't want to withdraw the publication. It may be issued while they are investigating some scientific misconduct or some other underlying issue. In this case, the reasons for the expression of concern are based on troubling problems about the analysis and the studies that were included in it. Those problems were brought to the attention of the editors by other researchers. If you're interested, I encourage you to go and read the expression of concern at the journal website. But that wasn't the only review or meta-analysis that came out in support of ivermectin for COVID-19. Another prominent one was this one by Pierre Corey et al. This review includes two very prominent pro-ivermectin for COVID-19 authors. Dr. Pierre Corey and Dr. Paul Marek. They published this review of emerging evidence that they say demonstrates the efficacy of ivermectin in prophylaxis and treatment of COVID-19. But again, just last week, the editor-in-chief issued an expression of concern for this article. And again, the details are available at the journal website to which I will link in the description below. So these are the two most prominent reviews and meta-analyses in favor of ivermectin for use of COVID-19. There's a third one you may have heard of, but that one was withdrawn by the authors themselves. I'll discuss that one a bit later. At any rate, readers of both of these articles are now faced with big warnings because of concerns from experts within the field about those analyses. So if that's the state of the published meta-analyses of ivermectin that have been touted as the basis for the use of ivermectin in COVID-19 patients, how about the clinical studies themselves? How about the actual clinical studies, including those clinical studies that went into those meta-analyses? One of the largest and certainly most significant studies to find a benefit for COVID patients from ivermectin is a study by El Ghazar and colleagues out of Egypt. This was reported as a randomized controlled trial 
looking at ivermectin for treatment and prevention of COVID-19. But this preprint has since been withdrawn from the server that hosted it, and the story of its withdrawal is itself interesting. The manuscript, which had not been peer-reviewed, was initially missing a lot of key information, and it seemed evidently shoddy right away. A number of people noticed this, and there was some criticism of the paper online. The manuscript went through several iterations, as a paper does, on the preprint server, and at one point in those iterations, the anonymized individual patient data became available. When that data became available, it then became evident that there were problems underlying the data that just didn't have any explanation from authentic data. There were patients who died before the study started. There were patients who were recorded as being hospitalized before the study started. There were patients whose data seemed to be exact copies of the data of other patients and on and on and on. There were also other ethical issues and there were things like plagiarism. The study was just a mess. And so eventually it was withdrawn from the preprint server. So how did this all unfold? Well, Jack Lawrence, a medical student in London, first noticed plagiarism issues and then noticed some data issues when the individual patient data became available. He contacted a few experts in this kind of scientific integrity analysis, including Nick Brown at Linnaeus University in Sweden, the epidemiologist Gideon Meyerowitz Katz at University of Wollongong in Australia, and Dr. Kyle Sheldrick, a physician and scientist also in Australia. Between them, they ultimately uncovered the problems that I described a few minutes ago, and they published about it on various platforms. In the interest of full disclosure, I should mention at this point that I've worked on a separate project with Gideon Meyerowitz Katz and Kyle Sheldrick, but that project is unrelated to ivermectin, and it's currently under review for publication. Now, mistakes happen, right? Correcting mistakes is a core part of the scientific process. But in this case, the underlying issue is enormous because this was a clinical study, and it was a clinical study on which treatment decisions for probably tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people were made, and it was probably fraudulent. Moreover, it was included in those meta-analyses that we discussed earlier. So it contributed to the general belief that ivermectin was effective for COVID-19. To make matters worse, the Elgazar study wasn't even alone because another study out of Lebanon, also included in the meta-analyses, was also soon found to have major data integrity problems that led to its retraction. You might be wondering how scientists can avoid this kind of problem when they're conducting meta-analyses in the future. In fact, the researchers who uncovered these issues have proposed just such an approach. A key to their published proposal is recognizing that some of the problems they uncovered were only identifiable from individual patient data and not from summary statistics. If clinical studies only provide summary statistics of their results, then people conducting meta-analyses or checking the integrity of those studies have only a limited set of tools, and to some extent they have to take clinical studies at their word. But if the clinical studies make individual patient data available, it becomes much easier to identify problems of data integrity. This idea might come, become a requirement or at least an expectation for future meta-analysis standards. Since we're back on meta-analysis, we've already covered two, but I mentioned a third meta-analysis. And this third meta-analysis originally found a benefit from ivermectin use for COVID-19. But that meta-analysis was withdrawn voluntarily by the authors because of the issues we've discussed. The authors have since posted a preprint of some findings from a revised meta-analysis, and this looks at the impact of these kinds of issues, the impact of potential fraud, and the impact of overweighting highly biased studies. When they remove the potentially fraudulent studies, then the benefit for ivermectin 
becomes non-significant. If they remove the potentially fraudulent studies and the studies at a high risk of bias, then the benefit for ivermectin vanishes. Let's get back to individual clinical studies. Here's another clinical study. This one was done in Argentina and also claimed to demonstrate a large effect from ivermectin treatment. It was published in something called the Journal of Biomedical Research and Clinical Investigation. Now this journal isn't a journal indexed in either PubMed or Web of Science. If you saw my other video on how to spot scientific misinformation, this is a big red flag. And I think this indicates that it is basically not a credible scientific journal. In fact, everything about this publication screams nonsense, non-science. But they published it anyway, in a matter of days from original submission to acceptance. And it was picked up on various media and touted by different ivermectin proponents to make a case in support of ivermectin for COVID-19. But did it really happen? Again, probably not. There are a bunch of inconsistencies, not just inconsistencies, real absurdities in the data, impossibilities. And those impossibilities and absurdities are sufficient to wonder whether the study ever really happened at all or could possibly happen as described. And the answer is almost surely no. Gideon Meyerowitz Katz and Kyle Sheldrick were again involved in identifying the problems with this study. Uh, Gideon wrote a great Twitter thread about the nonsense that is this Carvalho study, and Kyle posted what is perhaps my favorite single tweet summarizing the awfulness that surrounds this whole mess. He wrote, the first author of this study, Dr. Cavallo, has now refused to release any data until, quote, the pandemic is over, end quote, and indicated that I should not contact him again. The most recent clinical study about ivermectin to have made the news is a study out of Mexico City. This was actually a government-sponsored study. Mexico City officials distributed kits to many COVID patients along with some other medications and ivermectin. They later put out a preprint on a preprint server, Soch Archive, and in that preprint, they claimed that ivermectin provided a benefit in reducing hospitalization. There are just so many problems with this study. It was extremely poorly done. There's no way to distinguish any effect from ivermectin as opposed to the other things that were in the kit and there was no randomization. But in addition to all of these problems, the study appears to be deeply unethical. The people who published this preprint in Social Archive were representatives of the government program that distributed it. So they had an interest in the policy. That's a clear conflict of interest. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. This was an unapproved medication and it was distributed to sick people as part of a government program. There's no indication that the people who took part in this were informed that they were part of a study of an unapproved medication. Did the study target the disadvantaged who otherwise didn't have access to medications? We have no idea. The lack of ethics in this study have been compared to the famous Tuskegee syphilis experiment where over 400 African Americans with syphilis were left untreated and became unknowing and unwilling participants in an experiment to monitor the progression of disease without their knowledge or consent. On February 4th of this year, the steering committee of Soch Archive removed the paper. They withdrew it. This was the first paper ever withdrawn from that preprint server. They explained their reasoning as follows. We're withdrawing the paper and replacing it with a tombstone that includes the paper's metadata. We're doing this to prevent the paper from causing additional harm and taking this incident as an impetus to develop a more comprehensive policy for future situations. The metadata will serve as a reference for people who follow citations to this paper on our site. They go through their grounds and 
the ethics, the lack of ethics in this study are a central uh, part of its problem and a central part of its misinformation. So that about covers what I wanted to cover in this video. So how do things stand? Well, the initial in vitro study that showed that ivermectin inhibited SARS-CoV-2 replication in Vero E6 cells has been replicated, but it's been shown not to hold up in cells that are more relevant to the human lung and airway cells. Clinical studies in support of ivermectin for COVID-19 haven't held up. Meta-analysis of clinical evidence in support of ivermectin for COVID-19 have not held up. And the best meta-analyses, like the Cochrane meta-analysis, have not found a consistent benefit from ivermectin for patients with COVID-19. I think it'll be the task of future historians to figure out why ivermectin research in 2020 through 2022 has been so plagued with fraud and misconduct. Now, it's still possible that a trial that's currently being run, like the principal trial, will show a benefit for COVID patients from ivermectin. That's still possible, and it would be great if that were true. It's perhaps not so likely, but it's still possible. But even if that comes to pass, it seems basically impossible to imagine that one of those currently running trials, a well-designed, well-structured, well-run trial, will show the level of benefit that has been claimed by ivermectin advocates, because the studies that have shown that great level of benefit have turned out to be problematic in a myriad of ways. Now, if you've enjoyed this content, feel free to give it a like, let me know what you'd like to see in upcoming videos, and in the meantime, stay safe, get vaccinated.